Bienvenido a todos. It is the Paseo Podcast. It is Tuesday, May 25th, and we're especially happy to welcome our next guest, Ali Six. He is a multimedia artist from Chicago. I know him as Ali Six, but I also know him as Nico Locander. If you're in Chicago, you've seen his art all over the place. How are you doing? Welcome to the Paseo Podcast. I'm doing good. Thanks for having me. What should our audience know about you? I am an artist from Chicago. I started drawing cartoons when I was younger. Then in high school, I got into graffiti, which was, you know, learning typography and learning how to do bubble letters around the city, vandalizing, uh, using spray paint. Um, it taught me color theory and uh, how to take a sketch to a wall. Once I got arrested a couple of times, I figured graffiti wouldn't be a stable way to make a living. So I um, figured if I combine my love of cartoons when I was younger with what I learned from graffiti. Um, maybe I can produce a, a wide body of work that would be in galleries and I can, you know, happily make a career out of it. Um, so I created a cartoon character um, called Richard the Raccoon and um, he embolizes everything uh, that who I am, I guess. Uh, whereas I'll paint him skateboarding, playing basketball, um, my heritage being Puerto Rican, um, you know, I'll paint him doing graffiti. Um, so it's a direct reflection of who I am. Uh, and he's definitely the, the subject of my work is Richard Eric. I remember um, years ago seeing some of your art, and I always found it interesting that you kind of bring in interests into your raccoon character. And then I had seen another one of yours where it was raccoon, um, your raccoon character with, I think, Scotty Pippen, if I'm remembering correctly. Does that sound familiar? Yeah, this is like back, uh, this is like back in the day. Yeah, it's a collaboration I did with uh, my good friend Deal. Um, he works at Saint Alfred. Uh, he's an amazing artist. One of the, the people who inspired me to learn how to acrylic paint when I was younger. But yeah, I, d I did a collaboration with him. I also released that exactly what you're talking about that image on um, apparel a couple of weeks ago, um, which was like a pre-order. Only for a weekend. Are you putting your art on apparel regularly? Or I know you said it was only for like a limited time, but are you like always putting new apparel out or was that just like a, a one-time thing? Yeah, no. So I definitely do uh, merchandise. Um, I try not to flood my market. So the reason why I did create the, uh, I brought back the image that I did with Deal, uh, which was inspired by the flu game, um, mm -hmm. game with, with Jordan when he uh, got sick. I played played the playoff game and they still won. From like setting up your show, other projects to apparel, like is that all just going through you and you're flying solo or like do you have a, a bit of help? I pretty much do everything myself. Um, you know, there, there are people who can do certain things that I cannot. So like my roommate, he scopes um, on Blender and he can, he can create an animations. I can't do that, you know, mm -hmm. but if, you know, if I need that, I, I'll pay him to create those files, um, you know, and one of my friends, he does ceramics and pottery, you know, so I'm, I don't have the time to dabble into that because I know that's something that takes uh, a lot of time to master. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I'll pay him to create, you know, mugs, ceramic mugs or whatever, but whatever I can learn how to do that, I, I figure, you know, it doesn't take much time. Uh, I do myself and I design everything. Um, for my merchandise, and I, I paint everything myself. Um, my murals, I'm usually painting alone because I paint very fast. Um, I've gotten really uh, just well acquainted with how to paint a mural, and then uh, as well as being physically fit, um, I keep my body um, pretty pretty well, uh, how you say, nourished. You know, like I, I recently turned vegan for like the last three months, and um, I have an in-home gym, so I constantly, at least two times a week, I'm working out. Uh, so I'm able to create large murals uh, at a fast rate because, you know, my body isn't aching compared to how, uh, you know, it, it might be for other people. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Like, I don't, and I don't know that many people that aren't in the art world you know, really under, really understand that, that. It's more than just about the skill set you have that's a part of you or even like the, the mental toughness to like map things out and then actually implement, you know, the idea you have or you've, you've drawn out. But to also like push yourself physically, like I've seen you, I saw you, I remember seeing you put a mural up 
Uh, right. And like, I just see you like pumping it on this ladder, man. You're just like moving back and forth and you're like just getting it done. You were updating a, a previous mural that you had done in the same location. Um, and it was a hot ass day. <laughs> so I was just like, man, I sweat like walking to like take out my trash. Like, and this guy's out here, you know, multiple feet mural uh, putting it together. So I, I think that's a, a really strong point. Like there is a physicality to it. So taking care of your body, staying hydrated, especially on those hot, hot days. I mean, that, you've got to be churning these out at, at a rapid clip whenever a commission comes through, I'm sure, which is probably why people are always um, asking you or, or throwing work your way. Um, and even like seeing you collaborate with other artists, I think is important, too. I mean, have you found that in the Chicago art scene, do you feel like a lot of artists are like have that same collaborative spirit? Or do you feel like a majority of artists here in Chicago are kind of like, no, this is just my lane. I'm going to stick to it. I'm just going to kind of do my own thing. You know, much love to people doing their own thing, but I'm not really in the mood for, for collaboration. Like, how do you how do you feel artists are in the city? I think um, a lot of artists are definitely open to collaboration. Uh, over the years, you know, I've, I've tried to collaborate with a numerous people just so that there's a, you know, a bonding effect between you know, the whole community itself. Um, the graffiti culture is, it's a lot more aggressive. So coming from that to the whole street art muralist um, culture, uh, you know, it's just, it's just such a different vibe. So I definitely wanted to push, you know, everybody getting along rather than sec everybody's, you know, segregated. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, I, obviously I've had, I've had uh, different moments with uh, people who I'm, creating murals with or their ego gets in the way of things and they want to go out of line and you know i don't play that shit but you know it happens but um but i'm mm -hmm. still friends with all of them either way yeah i feel <laughs> so, you okay spill yeah. spill a little tea not not dropping names but a little, little bit of tea appreciate that i mean it is what it is you know yeah. it's like it's people it's like people try to get away with something if they can and it's, mm -hmm. you know yeah, like you give someone an in, there's the type of personality where you give someone an inch and they take a mile. I think yeah. there's but no, never, nothing's ever been like insane. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like it's never been like crossing the line insane. It's just like little shit. But mm -hmm. um, but no, yeah, like like I said, uh, I try to be friends with everybody. And, yeah. You know, sometimes there are conflicts within that's not about me. Mm -hmm. That it creates tension. You know, but um, yeah. I think everybody usually just tries to, to get along with everybody. I'm also curious about your name. Like, I don't think I've ever asked you this too. Like, how did you how did you choose the name Ali Six? Where does that come from? When I created my character Richie the Raccoon, I had drawn it around the time I was doing graffiti. Uh, because if you do graffiti and you do a character next to it, you get extra rounding points. Because not everybody who does graffiti knows how to paint a character or paint a character well. Um, so I drew a little raccoon, and I didn't think much of it. You know, those people on Instagram that liked it um, at that time. My Instagram was very heavy, just graffiti culture. Um, and then move forward a couple months later, I get arrested uh, for my fifth and sixth time. I get thrown out and I'm like, I need to do something different, right? So um, I looked upon the whole starting my own cartoon. And I started thinking of all the things I could do with him. And um, the fact that I chose a raccoon, it felt like he embodied the whole Chicago graffiti culture, whereas you have to go out between 1 a.m. to 5 a.m. to do graffiti, and uh, a raccoon is nocturnal. Um, as well as, you know, when you did, when I did graffiti, and a lot of people do graffiti, they steal spray paint from, like, Menards or, like, Kmart in the suburbs. And, you know, uh, it kind of reminded me of Sly Cooper, the game for the PlayStation, where the raccoon would, you know, kind of like Robin Hood, steal the, steal the stuff. Um, so I felt like the raccoon had a, a just like kind of signified what, what graffiti was in my mind. Um, so I, I started thinking of different ways I can, I can use him. And I figured I could create a graphic novel. That's one of, it was one of my dreams that I wanted to, as an artist to create was a graphic novel because I've, uh, I've been into the whole comic book culture since I was a kid. Um, so, with that, I felt the storyline would be about Aladdin, uh, and then my raccoon would be Apu. Um, so it'd be me hanging out with my raccoon buddy and doing graffiti around the city, and 
all these adventures and there would be a genie, you know. I don't want to give away too much. I'm lo- no, probably, I'm loving this, I'll man. I'll still probably make this <laughs> and I don't want somebody to take my idea. However, um, yeah, so because I thought of the whole Aladdin storyboard uh, connected with Chicago graffiti, um, I chose the name Ali because in Aladdin, Aladdin says to Jeannie, I want to be with the princess. And Jeannie's like, well, you can't be with a princess unless you're a prince. So then Jeannie makes Aladdin into Prince Ali. So that's where I came with Ali. And then the, the six comes from, at the time, I was really into Jordans. And my favorite Jordan model is the Jordan six. How has that played a role in influencing your art? I think, like I said, uh, I like to express my myself through my character. So, you know, I want to to show what culture I was brought up in. So, um, you know, when I do get the chance to to show um, the neighborhood or you know the food that I eat or the Puerto Rican flag, I definitely do that. Um, so, like, even when it was like. Uh, a really big push on Black Lives Matter, which should always be that. Mm-hmm. Um, I was painting, painting like um, boards that say a little Afro Afro body point, you know, because a lot of our culture, you know, because uh, a lot of the slaves came to Puerto Rico, they are not came, but you know, they're forced onto Puerto Rico. Yeah, um, we have heritage where we have. African American slash Puerto Rican, um, I used to, I was civilians, I guess, in Puerto Rico. Like my, my grandfather is like really dark. It's uh, mm-hmm. in Vega Baja. Um, mm-hmm. So it was like this whole side of the family. Yeah. Um, so I think it's important to, how you say, um, respect the whole, you know, African Puerto Rican culture. What about like getting your art noticed? Like, uh, uh, did you struggle to get your art noticed at for your art noticed at, at first? Um, like when when you no. transition to doing more like multimedia stuff? No, I think I was just very ambitious. Um, I took what I learned from graffiti. So in graffiti, it's like you want to the goal in graffiti is you want to be known. You know, you want to be like somebody that people respect because your graffiti name is up everywhere in the neighborhoods, right? So you want them to be all up and down buildings and, you know, just omnipresent. So I took what I learned from that and applied it to my career um, in the art world. So I've seen the result of me being omnipresent with my graffiti and how everybody respected me in that. So I figured if I put my character and put the posters of him around the city that would get me the respect in the art world. And that would be my advertising and marketing or when I do put pieces inside of galleries for them to be sold, you know, mm-hmm. people, if they're able to recognize something that they they've already seen, um, they don't want to, to buy it in a gallery. Uh, so it didn't really take me long because I definitely put in that work to advertise uh, my character everywhere. And what about like looking at from when you began to where you are today, like if you had to choose like three lessons, like three key takeaways that you've learned in the Chicago art scene um, that, that you would like, especially think might be helpful for aspiring artists listening, you know, what would those three lessons or, or three takeaways be? Um, I think whenever you do business with people, uh, make sure there's a contract um, present, um, and, you know, it, it could be even somebody that, you know, um, you know, business is is business. You don't, you want it it to be clear between both parties, between you and the other person that, you know, you're both on the same page about everything. Um, you can accidentally leave details out or they'll accidentally leave details out and there'll be a misunderstanding that kind of could ruin or leave a bad taste in a relationship. Uh, so I think contracts are very important. And um, also, if you have a character or starting a character within that contract, if you're licensing, which is letting somebody use your image, if you have a character, make sure 
that you're retaining your intellectual property rights for that character. That means that if you put in a contract that they can use your image and you don't say, I also retain my intellectual property rights, they can now own that character and you wouldn't really be able to use it. And if you do use it, you know, they might bring this contract up if they notice that they own it in the next couple of years. Hmm. And then, you know, every, all the money that you made off of it, they could sue you wow. uh, and take, take all that from you. Um, so that, that's the first thing. It's like making sure that you bring contracts into situations with business, because I've one time had, you know, had done business with people that I thought I could trust. And at the end of the day, they, they sent, they gave me a contract a day before uh, a gallery and a day before that we were dropping merchandise and the merchandise um, contract was just bullshit. Like it was me making 15% and then making 85%. And uh, oh initially gosh. when they had, they had initially said that it was 50, 50, you know? Yeah. Um, whereas wow. the gallery side, you know, of it, you know, there, it was still, I was on contract for 3070, but still though, I designed everything. I designed all that, that merchandise that was produced. And now at, at the long run, they're, they're making, you know, they made a lot more than I did, which is, yeah. it would be fine if I didn't design everything. But the fact that I designed everything, I put in that, that labor um, time just to, just to make sure everything was correct. Um, it just felt like I got a stab in the back by, by somebody a day before or gallery opening mm. so yeah first thing would be black contracts um second thing would be just um you know work ethic is very important you know if you want to make sure that uh your artwork is is known you know you have to put in that that time to advertise your work around the city um and you know network with people uh so that they understand they know what your brand is. Um, so just trying to figure out exactly what your brand is and, and spreading it as much as possible um, to uh, whoever you think would could help you, you know? And I guess that everyone is not to be afraid uh, to ask for help because I do, like, I'm a multimedia artist Whereas I've learned how to tattoo from your uncle, you know, because mm -hmm. I asked him, like, can you teach me how to tattoo? You know, like I've learned how to make rugs, you know, because I looked on, on YouTube, you know, but I guess I didn't ask anybody, but, you know, I just looked that up. You know, I learned how to paint, you know, because I asked somebody, you know, how do you do this? And they explained mm -hmm. to me the patience and layering um, paint. Um, you know, learning how to build something, you know, it's, there's nothing wrong with asking people for help. And I think that's something that, that, you know, in America, we always have, we just have this ego where it's like, you know, like, it's like, oh, we'll figure that out, you know, but it's mm -hmm. like, we should all be helping each other to, to try to, you know, lift each other up in each, whatever path that we have. Doors closing. Local media outlets are essential. In 2020, as communities, businesses, and citizens came to terms with a pandemic that disrupted the flow of daily life, the need for accurate local information escalated. Information including which businesses were open, which were closed, where to get tested, and vaccinated. When media organizations closed their newsrooms and went remote, the reporting did not stop. They held local government accountable, documented historic moments for social justice, shared the humanity behind tragedy. Meanwhile, the funding for that work was drying up. Businesses whose ads helped support the media were closed. Revenue disappeared. Donating today at SaveChicagoMedia.org can ensure your local newsroom continues reporting the stories that matter despite the current economy. Investing in local media is funding your community. Give today and help us do the work that matters. Donate now at SaveChicagoMedia.org. To end our show on a lighter note, we have a, a few questions here. Um, 
you had to choose one spot in Chicago for like your favorite Puerto Rican food, like there's just a spot that their food just hits different. Like what is your favorite go-to Puerto Rican joint in Chicago? I mean, other than other than the carts that are around, you know, Humble Park, I think those are yeah. great um, snack options where you can spend like, you know, a dollar or two dollars on Acapulia Papas or like all the other other great things that are there. Um, those are great, great places to start, but I really like Kibaritos y Mas. Um, I believe that's off of Fullerton. Um, yeah, Fullerton, Kimball, I think. Yeah, I think it's I Fullerton think. and Kimball. Yeah, yeah, I think, I think. <laughs> um, but I like going there. Um, you know, the food is, is well portioned as well. It's just, it's really good. So, yeah. Um, I think you, you grew up right I grew uh, right up behind, behind Borinquen. I grew up behind Borinquen. Yeah, that's that's where I used to go when I was a kid. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, they closed, but that's 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 what he would eat those I used to get. Funny sure. enough, funny enough, uh, Borinquen actually is credited with inventing the hibarito. Do you know no that? Way. Yeah, 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 yeah. His name was Pete. He was the owner, the original <laughs> owner of Borinquen. I kid you not. I kid you not. <laughs> Yeah, I grew up, I was best friends with his son back in the day. Yeah. Oh my gosh. And I'll, I'll go there for everything. But yeah, there's actually, I think WTTW, PBS, the PBS affiliate here in Chicago did a special on him. I bet you if you looked up like on YouTube, Hibarito Chicago, Pete is on there. It, uh, he got interviewed. But so yeah, we, we invented it here in Chicago, the Hibarito. Yeah, that's that's what I've always known was that it was, uh, it, it's not like a Puerto Rican traditional no. dish. It's like uh, do not uh, go to the uh, island and ask for a hibarito. <laughs> like a Chicago thing, yeah. but uh, yeah, yeah, it's pretty awesome that you know that we we have that because I'm sure you know yeah, if you, there ha there probably are places maybe in San Juan or something that do have hibaritos. Um, oh yeah, you know it's the fact that that made it all the way over there, or yeah. probably in other states that do have Puerto Rican culture. That's sick you know? it's, it's impressive for sure um i'm definitely obsessed with you buddy those no question um but uh switching gears a little bit to just speaking of obsessions um you know what is one thing that you're obsessed with today it can be related to puerto rican culture unrelated to puerto rican culture you know movies tv shows comic books hobbies whatever you know what are you most obsessed with today um i think you know, just trying to find, uh, if it's not, I'm, I'm just kind of obsessed with my work. Yeah. <laughs> I just try to go to the next, the next, uh, job or the next project. Um, I'm always just trying to stay busy. Um, if I'm not working on something for a week. It really gives me anxiety. Um, I'm just like constantly busy. I'm just so used to that for so many years that like, yeah. you know, when I do, like I said, if I do have a week where I'm not doing something, it's just, feel like I'm, I'm failing myself. Um, but other than being obsessed with my work, I'm obsessed with evolving as a person as well. Um, just trying to find out, you know, what's the best thing for yourself, you know, um, how to evolve, you know, in the sense of, um, physical or mental, um, you know, I just try to be the best person I can be to be a role model for my brother and sister. Yeah, um, for sure. And any anybody else who you know who who does um, look up to me or finds me as an inspiration, you know, I, I try to push, you know, um, physical fitness and mental health, and you know, uh, how you say believing in yourself, you know. Yeah. Because I think I think that's one of the things if you want it to be an entrepreneur, you know, you just have to. The first step is believing that you can really do it and you can visualize yourself in a position that you want to be. So, so um, just speaking of being obsessed with your work, let's stick on that thread. I mean, what projects do you have going on right now? You know, what projects do you have coming up? You know, what should our audience know? Um, so I do have a show um, with Vertical Project Space, which is off of Chicago and Damon. Um, it's going to be on June 19th and it has an assortment of work that are multimedia. Uh, whereas there are laser cuts, there are a piece, a piece of furniture, there's painting on grenades, thing on mirrors. Um, it's going to be 
skate decks that are painted um, and not actually not even painted there's like a hologram on there um, there is going to be like metal figures that are presented as well metal sculptures 10 inch metal sculptures um, and the show is called trust um, and it all just kind of has to do with um, you know the whole body of work has the subject of trust in different ways whereas you know um, Adam and Eve with the apple or gravity with the apple or, you know, an apple being on somebody's head to, to get shot off with an arrow. Um, so a lot of it does have the, the apple in it, you know, in different parts of the show. But, um, but yeah, so I have that coming up as well as I have a couple murals, um, about to paint a mural in Wicker Park on walking wood, um, painted it before, but now the Wicker Park uh, Chamber of Commerce is uh, commissioning me to paint again. Um, and in commemoration of, um, I think her name is Maria. Um, she had gotten stabbed um, while working at the Walgreens that it's right next to, uh, which right. is unfortunate. Uh, so doing a, a mural that commemorates her and I have a couple other mural projects coming up. Um, the collaborations, so always pretty, pretty busy, especially in the summertime. Being somebody who paints murals and in the winter time, you can't really do that because yeah. the paint, um, paint cans don't really work. So, no, well, they do, and I can freely be out. You know, it gets a lot more busy. Uh, this is prime. This is prime time for you. We're gonna we're in getting in the summertime shy, so it'll be exciting to see you out and about throughout the city. Um, really curious uh, for people that are listening to this that you know don't want the conversation to end, that want to keep up with you, keep up with your work. I know you mentioned uh, the upcoming show on Juneteenth, June nineteenth. Um, actually, when this airs, it'll be. Not this Saturday, but the following Saturday. So everybody listening, go, definitely go check that out. Uh, but between now and then, you know, how can people keep up with you? Do you have social media uh, channels, uh, website? You know, give us all the things. How do people stay up to date? I uh, usually keep um, all my new projects on my Instagram. Uh, my Instagram is at ali underscore six underscore. I, I treat it like a portfolio. So um, all my work is usually updated on there. Um, and then where I put my merchandise would be ALI, the number six, Chicago.bigcartel.com. Ali six multimedia artist from Chicago. Thank you so much for being on the Paseo podcast today. Appreciate it. Thank you. Doors closing. Los medios de comunicación locales son esenciales. En 2020, cuando las comunidades, las empresas y los ciudadanos se enfrentaron a una pandemia que interrumpió el flujo de la vida cotidiana, aumentó la necesidad de información local precisa. Información que incluyera qué negocios estaban abiertos, cuáles cerrados, dónde hacerse las pruebas, dónde encontrar ayuda. Pero cuando los medios de comunicación cerraron sus redacciones y se alejaron, la información no se detuvo. Exigieron responsabilidades al gobierno local, documentaron momentos históricos para la justicia social, compartieron la humanidad detrás de la tragedia. Mientras tanto, la financiación de ese trabajo se estaba agotando. Las empresas cuyos anuncios ayudaban a sostener los medios de comunicación cerraron o se paralizaron. Los ingresos desaparecieron. Donar hoy en SaveChicagoMedia.org puede garantizar que su redacción local siga informando de las historias que importan a pesar de la economía actual. Invertir en los medios de comunicación locales es financiar tu comunidad. Dona hoy para ayudarnos a hacer el trabajo que importa. Dona ahora en SaveChicagoMedia.org.